Aloha and welcome to Coffee Without Milk, a podcast presented by Maui Institute for Modern Music and Ebb and Flow Arts. More information about upcoming concerts, events, and educational opportunities can be found at www.ebbandflowarts.org. Hello! Hello, Loli. Welcome all. We have a wonderful podcast today, most distinguished podcast of several Hawaii-based composers. Loli, I have great news. We've been studying things very much. Let me show you, please. We have graphs, Loli. You see? The rate of optimism is up. The rate of the rate of optimism is a little bit indirect. Sycophancy is up steadily. The comorbidity quotient also under eyes. The stock market is almost defying gravity. And the mendacity index is under eyes. Yeah, but, but that, uh, this is, this is not good news, doctor. Oh, Louis. If you don't like it, if you don't like it, then turn it this way, Loli. What difference does it make? It's all grass, nothing. Yeah, but can you, can you tell us what's going on here? Yeah, Loli, can you give me a cup of coffee, but without cream, please? Uh, sorry, we don't have cream. Um, would you prefer coffee without milk? <laughs> Very funny. That's the point of our title that it is something we maybe don't want to do, but at least we have the option to do it under normal circumstances, and now we don't. I understand. How about, Loli, if you gave me coffee without half and half? Oh, well, which half of the coffee would you prefer with milk, and which half would you be prefer with cream? Oh, I don't know, Loli. Don't be so silly. How about, how about some creamer, dairy creamer, doctor? What do you mean, dairy creamer? You know, uh... Ah! Oh, this is awful. Let's get on with this podcast. Okay, thank you very much. Well, welcome one and welcome all to Coffee Without Milk. Um... What a fine show as always. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Loli. Thank you, Robert Pollock. Um, yeah. We have a lot of great guests this afternoon, uh, all united by a common thread. Um, not all composers, performers based in Hawaii, but also all who have worked um, with one of the finest violinists and concert masters in the world, um, Mr. Iggy Jang. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Robert, the moderator for this okay. wonderful afternoon of conversation. And it should be a lot of exciting topics and a lot of exciting music to listen to. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So what the common thread, of course, is that all of us, all of our uh, compositions have been uh, performed, not all of our compositions, but uh, the works uh, some works of all, from all of us have been performed by Iggy Jang. And we wanted, before we get started, let's introduce everyone, please. So let's go around. Uh, perhaps we can go in alphabetical order. Michael, why don't you say hello? And Hello, I'm Michael Fumai, composer. Uh, uh, I'm Takuma Ito. I'm also a composer based in Hawaii. Yeah. I guess I'm next. John yeah. Magnuson, composer. Yes. Uh, based in Hawaii. And you're at the, um, is it the uh, University of Hawaii West Campus? Is that the correct time? University of Hawaii West Oahu. West Oahu. That's, that's right. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Osborne, and I too am a composer based in Hawaii. 
and myself, a uh, composer based uh, on Maui, as opposed to most of our guests who are on Oahu. Peter Swansea, uh, another Maui-based composer, and I've been working with Ebb and Flow Arts now for well over a decade, and uh, excited to be here with you all today. Uh, starting to sound a little bit like a composer 12-step help group. Hi, I'm Don. <laughs> uh, yeah, Don Womack. I am at UH Manoa, where I've been since the dawn of time, uh, <laughs> working up on 27 years now. Um, once again, we'll go around because what we have in mind is to uh, offer selections by each of you that Iggy has participated in as a performer. But before we do, you know, let's take our hats off. Uh, our board of uh, Ebb and Flow Arts Board of Directors has commissioned a statue of you, Iggy, uh, to be placed. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's, a, it's enormous. <laughs> it's it's no, but it is remarkable that among all of the other things you do, which includes being the concertmaster of the Hawaii Symphony, and uh, a world-renowned musician performed in places like Turkey, France, South Korea, of course, the mainland, um, that you would take the time not just, you know, to devote yourself to one or a couple of us, but all of us. And um, what, what is you, the philosophy behind that, Iggy, in terms of your the, the, your the role you feel you play in our community as a, a leader of the major cultural organization in the state? Well, um, thanks for having um, me and my colleagues, first of all. Um, I think when I grew up in, in France, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm um, towards new music. You know, I remember being in the Paris Conservatory and we were uh, performing music by uh, Olivier Mission. I remember specifically a performance of L'Ascension for orchestra. Uh, that, um, our youth orchestra in the, in the conservatory performed and, 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 and Mr. Mission was there. Uh, you know, we, a revered figure in France. and. I remember listening on the radio to a concerto by, uh, I think it was Henri Dutilleux that uh, Isaac Stern had uh, commissioned. Um, and you know, the um, André Jolivet, and I remember taking theory classes and there were things by Ivan Loriot for Ornn Martineau, so all these sort of new sonorities. Um, and that there was a bit of a dichotomy between that and some of the old-fashioned teachers, uh, you know, who were just uh, anchored in their own uh, music and didn't have much of a, a desire to, to broaden their palette. But um, that kind of uh, stayed with me, this sort of uh, um, looking ahead, looking to the future, you know, you're looking at the present with the, the composers, the living composers, but you as well, looking into the future. And so I think um, just uh, being a part of the creation process, uh, the composers, you know, um, trying to uh, respect their artistic vision, uh, but uh, to know that you're part of the uh, creation process and that you're bringing the music to life, I think that's uh, a, 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 an integral part of the process that's maybe even more so than if you're just playing some uh, Bach or Brahms or Beethoven. And you know that uh, those uh, have been created many, many times over and over. But to be part of uh, 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 these um, collaborations with uh, composers and to try to do justice to their work, I think, is uh, that we all, all performers, I think, are uh, striving to, to, uh, to do, to continue on the legacy of, of new music. Well, it's, it's not... Uh usual or uh, that that we would have someone so committed as you to to modern uh, works uh, there's a there's um, a tendency as you say to um, stay with the classics with the with the works more familiar to our audiences uh, not to take that risk to your career let's say to to go out on a limb in the way you have and at one point, you uh, you, ha you commented um, in an event that uh, that um, uh, 
working on this modern music actually has enhanced your musicianship, your techniques, so that you can apply them to the classics, perhaps in a in a more original way, in a in a in a more refreshed way. Is that fair to say? Yeah, of course. I mean, it expands your angles, but uh, expand your angles. Um, but I think it was wasn't it you who said something like, mm. you know, if you do new music, it expands your your lungs capacity, right? Mm. Um, mm. To to discover things you haven't done before or new music, and if you just stay with what you know, the classics, your mm -hmm. lungs shrink. Mm. So, what would you rather? Do? <coughs> Is this a COVID? <laughs> No, uh, um, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, it it just expands your knowledge. Your you so if you're getting very specific as far as technique, then yes, you expand your knowledge of technique and you you practice things that you wouldn't practice before. Um, mm -hmm. It just enriches your arsenal, which that's yeah. is why it benefits all sides of your your art, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. doing new music for new music. I think I'm, I'm, you know, I think maybe the difference with me, with maybe some of your other guests, your other guests are, are you know, spend a lot more time on new music and I make a career out of it. And for me, it's a little different. It takes me maybe a little longer to learn a new music because it's a new language that I have to acquire each time, mm. but it's beneficial to everything else I do. But can we stop talking about music yes. and talk about Yes, me? okay, okay. Um, one, one other thing is that, though, that you have um, kind of a non-judgmental attitude about music that is either, you know, liking it very much or not liking it or all, but it, it, you're not you don't tend to impose your ego maybe in that sense on the music, which is yeah, probably you know, why you are able to do so much with us. I remember when I was, uh, again, at the Paris Conservatory and we yeah. we played things like uh, Claude Balif, Solfeggetto, who yes. you, knew, you knew Claude Balif. The, and I, yeah. we also played a little bit of the sequence of I forgot which number by Luciano Berrio, mm -hmm. um, uh, the fantasy by Schoenberg. And I remember that we had class recitals and, and we all had to perform a little bit of those musics. And, 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 and I had good feedback uh, from judges or teachers. And maybe that's why I, I thought, oh, maybe I have an affinity to that. Um, and I think it's very important to to be open to all kinds of music and, you know, having had the chance of traveling around in, in Europe and, and in the U.S. and see all the different styles. I think um, you have to respect the art, the uh, artist integrity, the composer's integrity. Mm -hmm. and they have very different styles. I think the one complaint that I have sometimes is please make... Uh, music on, on the piece of paper that is easy for me to read. I think that's my biggest pet peeve is when there's a piece of music and it's really, I think the software has a lot to do with it because some, sometimes the algorithms finds for the most logical way, which sometimes is the most illogical ways for performance. Uh, that's the biggest uh, beef I have. But um, other than that, um, I, I yeah, I, I I'm ho I hope that uh, every, that composer will say that I respect their music. There was one incident here in, in our living room where you were rehearsing the work of Rashid Kalamulin with Scott Anderson, the duo. With the clarinet, yes. Yes. And there was a, some controversy over what dynamics to use because apparently Kalamulin didn't Put a lot of dynamics, and there was there was this exchange. Thankfully, it, there were two two different languages, so <laughs> could have gotten lost in translation. But it was more or less you were saying, you know, I only read what's on the page. Don't ask me to interpret yeah. beyond that. Really, in a sense. 
Well, maybe that's the discussion we're going to have today, although yeah. we don't want to be here until, uh, you know. No, tonight. no, we have to. <laughs> um, but what I remember is, is Rashid just wanted us to play and to perform like we are true performers, almost like in a virtuoso way. And maybe yeah. in the end, composers, they write everything on, on, on the on piece of paper and they can be very detailed and precise. But in the end, I think they, they like it when we just bring life to the music. Mm -hmm. Well, as I, uh, my recollection is that it was a, a fabulous performance. Uh, it got a standing ovation at a concert of ours in the middle of the concert, which is pretty unusual. But anyway, let, why don't we move on um, right now um, and, and begin with Tom. And let's work our, our way around. Does anyone have a, a additional comments to make right now about what Iggy has said? For me, it was it's quite reve revelatory the, uh, to uh, about uh, Messiaen being in in the audience that uh, you you'd never uh, told me. And so, uh, no doubt, you know, it's experiences like that that um, are very formative as a, how old were you Iggy when you you saw and did you actually meet him no he was one of those figures who you just saw from a distance and I was really really young so I probably didn't know what was going on but how uh, old were a few you few years later I was 12 12 um, well. but yeah but my sister was a little older and she actually went to the premiere of his uh, opera I think Saint Francois d'Assise I forgot exactly the name of his mm. opera and she went to to see that opera live. Uh, mm. and she said it was quite uh, momentous. Yeah, but I, I saw that, that um, live too. You oh. did, John. Yeah. So finally, someone yeah. else other than me talking. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, John, maybe in a, in a quickly, can you tell us about it? It was long, <laughs> and it was so <laughs> colorful. It was just in mm. incredible. It was at the La Bastille, the Opera Bastille. And, and yeah, I remember it was a very, very late evening and it started early. So, um, but it was quite incredible. And the old Martino was, mm, was yeah. part of that. And um, I, I think, yeah, Monsieur was a very religious man, correct? And I think it's, it's, it's a very spiritual experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Something I didn't know actually until recently was he was commissioned by the Kennedy Center, I think, uh, to write uh, the uh, Canyon au Tua. Uh, for, as an anniversary, like a commemoration for the United States. So he, he instead of using like New York that, that they wanted to be featured and as the piece, he wanted to celebrate the nature. So he went to the national parks, Bryce Canyon and uh, other places in Utah. But uh, his second choice was actually to come to Hawaii and uh, uh. write about the birds here. So uh, uh. there's in the canyon, um, that, that piece, the Canyon of the Stars, there's some uh, Hawaiian bird calls in the in the piece as well, mm. which I didn't know. Mm. Sort of, but they don't sound anything like Hawaiian birds. But that's a concert. <laughs> but that that's a conversation for another day. Missy on trivia. Another little known fact is apparently he was an avid collector of Aloha shirts. Go oh figure. really? Aloha shirts. Wow. Tom, uh, you've selected. Uh, you're overheated. Uh, the isn't it the fourth movement? Yeah, this is, um, I guess I should just say, uh, you know, my background working with Iggy. Um, I moved to Hawaii from uh, Los Angeles uh, 14 years ago, I think, just over. And, um, you know, L.A. was a real hotbed of musical activity and there was a really strong um, contemporary music scene there. And so coming to Honolulu, um, you know, I naturally expected that there would be less of that going on. Um, but it made me really realize uh, right away that um, there are a few key people here um, who are making things happen uh, in terms of contemporary music. Uh, one of them, Robert, is you uh, and Ebb and Flow Arts. Uh, and uh, Iggy is also a key component, I think, of uh, what's happening here in terms of all kinds of music, but especially contemporary music as well. And so that was something I recognized. Uh, right when I got here, and um, it was really a goal of mine to write something for Iggy. Um, and I'd worked with with him, I think, as a conductor a few times, uh, but it wasn't until 2012 uh, that I had the chance to, uh, I had a commission from the uh, Hawaii Mu Music Teachers Association and uh, to, to write a piece 
for a competition. And so I asked Iggy and pianist uh, Jonathan Korth from the University of Hawaii uh, if they'd be interested. And they both said yes. Uh, so for me, that was a real fantastic opportunity and something I'd been waiting years, uh, you know, to, to write. And uh, so I ended up writing the piece shortly after um, I moved to Korea. And uh, I was living in Seoul for that academic year on a Fulbright grant. And uh, I think I, I arrived in Seoul like on August 2nd or 3rd. And uh, it's really, really hot in Korea in the summertime, I guess all over Asia. Mm. And I'll never forget coming out of the baggage claim area and the, the automatic doors parted. And it was like when you open up an oven that's set to like 450, uh, <laughs> it just hit me. And I ended up writing a piece uh, about all the, just inspired by heat <laughs> in general. And so the piece is titled Overheated and each of the four movements, um, it's actually four sections. It's played uh, without pause. Uh, the first is scorching, and then scalding, and then sweltering, and then shimmering. And uh, yeah, the fourth section, the fourth movement of this piece um, is meant to evoke the sight of flickering flames. And so the violin and piano end up doubling each other uh, throughout the second half of the piece um, in these really active, uh, quick textures. And uh, this piece received first prize, did it not, for the uh, that year? It, Hawaii it teachers. Did, it it yeah. did something I'm thankful for, um, mostly because it gave uh, it gave Iggy and me and Jonathan Korth a chance to go <laughs> to uh, the convention for the. Uh, Music Teachers National Association uh, for a performance. And that was actually a lot of fun because the convention took place in the Disneyland Hotel. <laughs> uh, and so as a thank you to both uh, Iggy and John, I bought them admission to uh, <laughs> Disneyland the next day. And I took Iggy on his first roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. And um, we produced um, that work as well on an ebb and flow concert at one point. That's so right. your work overheated, yeah. It was in uh, Studio 909. Let's, let's play that piece now.
Actually, I just want to say um, thanks, uh, first of all, to Robert uh, for bringing us all together today. It's nice to see uh, all these composers in one place. And, Combination uh, is better and, than competition. <laughs> that's right. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, guess, I guess I just want to reiterate how important I think Ebb and Flow Arts is here in Hawaii as the only uh, professional um, you know, new music organization here in the islands. Uh, and uh, just since I've been here over the past, you know, 15 years or so, um, it's responsible for, you know, countless concerts, uh, countless premieres of uh, music by local composers, music by uh, composers from abroad, um, and a lot of music that uh, would probably never be played here in the islands otherwise. So. Um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that, Robert, uh, how important I think your organization is here. Thanks, Tom and Iggy and Jonathan. And let's m now move on to um, uh, Michael and your selection and your collaboration. Didn't you study with Iggy uh, violin? Yes, Iggy yes. was my violin teacher. In yes. fact, most of the people on this screen were my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, Tom, you're, you're teaching at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, at the Manoa campus in the uh, Department of Music, as you are. Isn't that true, Michael? Um, not this semester. I am oh, okay. over with uh, John over at West Oahu. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, Iggy was my was one of my heroes growing up. Uh, the first mm -hmm. time I saw him perform with the symphony, was when I was learning how to play violin. And mm. I had gone to a, a program where they were uh, performing the Complete Brandenburg Concertos by Bach. And Iggy was playing what I consider the most difficult concerto, the fourth one, because mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of notes in that one. And I just remember like, wow, I wish I could study with that person someday. Uh, and I was just starting at that time, so I could barely even play a scale. <laughs> and um, so um, when I got to uh, Manoa for my undergraduate degree, uh, Iggy um, was my teacher. So I was very excited to, um, to learn from the master himself. And um, that's, that's uh, I, I enjoyed very much learning from Iggy. He, was, he has quite a sense of humor. Um, and when he teaches lessons and so i most of the times uh um i always wanted to ask him to play something by me and it wasn't until uh, i think it was my final year at uh that i mustered up some strength to ask Iggy if he would play something and uh it was a small piece for violin and cello that was on the symposium and uh, you know for me it was well, magic happened you know iggy is such a amazing performer what he can do um just sight reading is a is, is incredible and so uh you know several we've collaborated a number of times now um in different types of pieces uh mainly through the, the youth symphony here um as well as with the, the hawaii symphony and anytime i try to um if i have a project uh in hawaii or it's Hawaii-based, I always am thinking about Iggy. Like, how can I get Iggy involved? 
I really want him to play on this piece. And so um, uh, one of the, the pieces I think I, I wanted to share uh, uh, was a piece that was written not too long ago. I think it was now two years ago in 2017. And this is a piece that was almost never written because I actually almost had very little interest in writing it. Um, I had received a phone call from the UH Foundation. And it was a particularly big year uh, because they had, uh, I think, surpassed $1 billion in their endowment fundraising. Mm. And they wanted to do something very special to give to the donors as a mahalo. A thank you. Thank you note. And so they're thinking of what about a, a small composition that we could send to these donors? And um, so I'm hearing this. Okay, what, what, what kind of piece do you want? Um, oh, just something to say thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I have no idea what kind of piece to, say, uh, to write that would say thank you. And so I'm thinking um, I'm, I, I like to search, do a lot of research about uh, what the piece is going to be about. And so I wanted it to have to be something that had to do with UH and had to do with um, what the school's mission was all about, you know, research. And so I got, to, uh, I searched Google for uh, the science departments, the uh, astronomy departments, and they have a newsletter called Kaunana, which is a Hawaiian word for to perceive, or to, to discover. I said, oh, that's, that, that's interesting. Maybe I can roll with that, write about a piece that has to do about discovering, about research. And so what I'm thinking is, well, what is discovery in music? And I'm thinking, well, if I think about music history, it's the, uh, the kind of introduction of, of, of dissonances in music and how, you know, that that has um, become more accepted. And I'm thinking about a particular quote from a favorite, uh, famous um, person, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, who I think is once quoted as saying he stood on the giants, uh, shoulders of giants. And so I'm thinking, who are the giants in music? And for me, it's, well, Bach is one of them and all my favorite composers growing up and, and kind of imitating. And so, okay, I can, that, that's enough for me to write a piece and, and have it mean something about research so I can connect it in some way to uh, write something. And then that could, be, that could be sent out to these donors as a thank you. And so I wanted to write a piece that was uh, really much in the style of these giants and try to channel some of my own voice into their kind of style of music. And so that, that's how Kaunana was born. And it was also a piece that was meant to showcase made in Hawaii, uh, made particularly by the University of Hawaii system. So it, it would be uh, a piece that was composed by uh, a graduate and performed by uh, other graduates or current students or by faculty members. Um, and it would be recorded at the uh, Honolulu Community College Melly Studio, uh, assisted by the faculty there. So the recording engineers would also be students. So this was a piece that was supposed to showcase on every different level of the creation from, from the composition mm -hmm. to the finished product uh, made at the University of Hawaii, made in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I'm thinking about performers perform this piece, Iggy, Iggy, <laughs> I, I'm hoping Iggy will say yes. And uh, uh, as most of the times, Iggy always says yes. And so I'm, I'm very grateful. And so it was a piece for string quartet, mainly because I'm a string player. Um, and I, all my friends are string players. And so it was the easiest uh, kind of group to put together very quickly because it needed to be done quickly. And um, it was a great experience uh, working with Iggy. It was the first time that I worked with Iggy on a recording project. Uh, most of the times it was violin lessons or through a pre premiere performance. But Iggy was very helpful in, in guiding through the sessions and through the listening and, and giving feedback for um, through different takes. So before we listen, um, Iggy, do you have any additional comments on, on your work with this particular piece? And also, we didn't hear about your uh, work with Tom Osborne on Overheated. Uh, anything about that that you'd like to 
mention? I think um, I've had the chance with Tom, both Tom and Michael, um, to work on many pieces over the years. So um, my one common is that actually I feel like I want to become a better player even if I'm getting older every day. And I feel like each piece with time um, helps me become that better player. And, and, and it's almost to a point where I wish I would go back and and revisit some of the early pieces uh, from Tom and, and Michael and everyone, you know, and Don. Uh, and because I feel like maybe I'm not young anymore. I don't have the chicken spring, but um, I'm not a spring chicken, excuse me. <laughs> spring chicken. But, uh, but I feel like I could revisit those old pieces and, 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 and bring something new. Um, that actually more than specifically a piece uh, and, and you know they all have their own different style um, I know with with Michael we didn't have that much time and it was kind of fast paced pieces and there were four of us with Tom we had more time and I worked with John and um, you know it, uh, the, the clarity of the piece was was very right there and so um, those are you know personal uh, sentiments or feelings I had, but I think the overall arching of of, of wanting to revisit those pieces because um, I, you know we don't want to be here until midnight. We have a lot of pieces to go, but um, I think it's important to um, and I lost my train of thought. But but yeah, to to mm. when you bring the the music to life to um, in parallel to becoming a better player, I think. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. chef shell shelf life of a piece mm -hmm. nowadays of a composer is not very long, and that's sort of one thing that is unfortunate. You know, Bach is there, Mendelssohn is there, but new com new composers or composers of new music, the shelf life is not very long, and so you wish as performers that you could kind of, you know, open a drawer and and rediscover something more and more so that it's not just a one and done that's kind of my feeling well now that we have the time maybe we should think about that sort of thing golden oldies let's bring back some of the best ones but in any case now why don't we take a listen to the piece michael from i just described the kanana and um uh, let's hear it Thank you. 
Okay, that was very good. Thank you very much for that. We'll move on now to Takuma. Uh, what piece have you selected, Takuma, for us? Uh, the piece I selected was uh, it's called Stargazing. Uh, it was written. It's for violin and electronics. Uh, I originally wrote it. Uh, back in, I want to say 2010, uh, not for Yugi this time, but uh, for a violin professor when I was in, in grad school at Cornell, and Joseph Lin, who went on to teach, uh, joined the Juilliard Quartet after that. Uh, so he was a great, really great uh, performer. Um, he was doing a concert, uh, a, a box solo violin series, and he wanted to pair uh, each one of those pieces with a new commission. So he commissioned several of the students there, and I chose to write this piece called Stargazing, uh, based on the E major gavotte movement. Um, it's one of the more well-known movements, I think, of the violin sonatas. Um, so this, the meaning of the, the, the name of the piece, Stargazing, comes from the fact that it's uh, Cornell, uh, was was the home for Carl Sagan for a long time. And I, I would pass by his home, I think. Um, he, he was long past, passed away at that point, but um, his home's still there. And um, on my way to school, I'd pass by it, I think. I think that's what, what his, school, uh, his home was. Um, and <laughs> I, I, I was doing some research and uh, he was part of the golden record uh, that was put on the Voyager in back in the 70s, uh, which includes a lot of recordings collected from around the world. Uh, and one of the recordings that one of the music that was placed on that re record was the was the Bach E major Partita. So I chose to imagine that piece as if it was being discovered in space by some distant aliens. And uh, so that's where the electronics kind of come comes in. And yeah, so it, it's uh, in somewhat interactive. So uh, 
there's always questions about how the electronics lines up with the, the violin, the solo part. So I pre-recorded everything. Uh, so there's nothing that, that's uh, triggered by, by the live performer, but how it works is uh, I usually, I'm there to trigger certain events that, that was supposed, supposed to occur to coincide with the performer. So. Uh, yeah, so Iggy performed this a few years ago when Robert, you had the uh, great idea of pairing it, uh, pairing this piece to go along with a performance in in the planetarium. Uh, so and that was the first time that that's happened, despite mm -hmm. the name. So it was it ended up being a really perfect pairing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was fit to our theme, music of the spheres. This was a uh, in the Imaginarium in Kaneohe. Uh, and Takuma, you'd mentioned one of your relatives was, had suggested that the piece should be in. Oh, yeah, that was my the, mom. Yeah. <laughs> mom thought that it, that would be the perfect play, and it right. certainly was. And uh, once we get our um, Music of the Spheres going again, possibly at the new sphere uh, at, at the uh, Maui Ocean Center. This one is a state-of-the-art sphere. Peter has already met several times before the pandemic closed it down, but the, they're apparently starting to open up pretty soon, hmm. maybe in, in a limited way. But we, it, it would be ideal there, of course, as well. And is this Iggy performing it? This is I don't think so. No. Okay. Yeah, because there is a recording on your website as well that. Um, yeah, this one um, has gotten because it, I guess it's convenient. It's for solo violin, but um, yeah. there's not too many uh, solo solo violin and electronics works. So it's gotten more mileage to, mileage than I I've expected. So. Um, and I've gotten to work with a lot of great yeah. violinists as a result. Um, I yeah, guess the pairing with the Bach also helps. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's some yeah. sound, yeah. sounds of familiarity. Very, very well yeah, received. And we're talking light years of mileage, aren't we? <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, why don't we, uh, Iggy, uh, any, any comments about your collaboration? There were some uh, issues at the uh, Imaginarium uh, eventually resolves pretty well, but having to do with amplification, um, we feel like at the Maui Ocean Center that, uh, that we may not need it, but we'll, we'll of course check it at when the time comes, but the, the acoustic in that sphere is un unbelievable in terms of uh, the projection, okay, you know, just whispering at, down at the stage area and it's as loud as ever in the back. So. It should work quite well. But Iggy, did you have any additional comments about that? That I think the the only comment I have is that um, it's a piece that's with uh, the electronics, and there's a little bit of freedom. And sometimes, as a performer, sometimes you don't. There's if there's too much freedom, you don't know exactly when you should come in and things like that. Whereas um, mm. uh, you know, it's not like when you have a strict meter. Um, so. I remember that uh, the first couple times I just had the, the sense of timing and pacing was uh, something I had to work on with this piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, well then, why don't we listen to Stargazing uh, by Takuma Ito.
and why don't we now move on to John? Thanks, Robert. Yes. I, I want to say also, I, I want to uh, thank you and and Peter for uh, arranging this. It's it's great to see all of our colleagues here, all of mm -hmm. us together, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and to know that we're doing relatively well. <laughs> we'll talk about that, right? <laughs> well, at least we still have our senses of humor, right? And uh, I think you know it was you asked me to provide a piece for um, for this show. Yeah. And I realized that I really haven't, I mean, it, it, looking back at my projects, my recent projects, I, I haven't had uh, the pleasure of, of collaborating with Iggy. And the, the last real time was back in 2007, I think. So the piece that, uh, and that was a long time ago, huh, Iggy? <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually in Princeton still. Uh, I was uh, artist in residence there at the Institute for Advanced Study when you contacted me, Robert, to to um, to see if he, we had we had made contact. I think through um, your, your mother was a dear friend of Milton's, right? Yes. And and so um, we had made contact and. And I was writing this piece. Uh, it was uh, going to be performed by the um, by the uh, let's see, New York New Music Ensemble. I had a small series there at the at the institute, and so they were performing it. It was my last year there before I was coming to Hawaii to be the director of education at the. The then Honolulu Symphony, where I first worked with Iggy, as uh, I, I was on the dark side, he was on the light side. I think, right, Iggy? <laughs> you mean? You mean it? I was part of. Versus? I was administration. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we still need. We miss you because we haven't replaced you. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but but there, you know, there, I think we'll talk about later, but but Takuma, your project that that you roped all of us into the, the Sim Hawaii Symphony of the Birds has really done something amazing for music education here in Hawaii. So um, so but uh, back to this piece, it's called Dances Ab Dances Flow. Um, and and it's it's something that actually came out of the musical material was uh, destined for an opera um, that uh, that I was that I had been working on for a while there. Uh, it it ended up not happening um, uh, for various reasons, but the um, based on the koal koalau koalau the, yeah. the leper yeah yeah koalau. Um, uh, Kalua I Ko'olau is his full Hawaiian name, but he, uh, uh, it's an amazing story, Kauai yeah. story. I was born and raised on Kauai and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and perhaps later in life, I'll be able to do something with it. So, because I do have a lot of music that I, that I produce for it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but I've been, I, you know, looking back at this piece, there, there, there were three movements and, and the things that my my ear, I think, was was um, was bordering on an orchestral ear. I was hearing big sounds, and that's what that's what um, the uh, I th I think the let's see, Joanna was playing cello. Iggy, you were playing violin. Uh, Robert, you were on piano, and Scott Anderson was on clarinet. And so the the quartet there, uh, and so this first movement is really it's the scene is is early morning, and uh, with and and as the piece evolves, the sun is coming up, and it's one of those sort of you know parts of of the narrative where the audience. Uh, perhaps is experiencing a scene change, but it's a um, um, it's really an opening. 
So that's what we'll be hearing on the second movement um, that that um, it was very challenging to write, but I wanted to do something new. Uh, and that is to really sort of stretch time out and and see how slow we could slow down our heartbeat. Uh, and and I think that was that was uh, I don't know if that, that was such a long time ago, you might not remember it, but um, that that was I, I love the fact that, you know, performers like you, Iggy, and you, Robert, as as a composer performer are willing to go there mm. and to to um, to believe in a vision that might not be like any other vision you've experienced in music, or or that you that you perhaps an audience doesn't, um, and that is that part of the collaboration uh, is is I think a really integral part to making progress in music. Um, my friend Somei Sato, the Japanese composer. Uh, I, I had invited him to my, uh, to the series that I ran in Princeton uh, before it was, this was maybe a year before I wrote Dances at Dances Flow. And his thinking about music and about really holding on to that essence of what the piece is about and, and, and being involved in the rehearsals and making sure that the, the performance uh, reflects what that vision is uh, can be really bracing, wonderful. The um, memory for me as well was that was one of the most harrowing trips that we took. Remember we were we were at the, what was it, Baldwin High School or something. And then the next day we performed it at Atherton, but in between was a horrific storm. Uh, we thought we couldn't leave that the, that morning to, to go to Oahu. The, the rain was, was uh, so out of range. Uh, we just, my wife, cuisine, and I thought, well, let's try, see what happens. And we literally drew, drove down the Haleakala Highway in two, two feet of water. Uh, and lo and behold, there was a Hawaiian Airlines flight. So we all made it over to Oahu. When we got back to Maui, we found that not our house, but to uh, the right of us and to the left, there had been huge mudslides literally filling one house to its ceiling with mud. So uh, all of which is to say that the dedication of musicians <laughs> like Iggy and at that time Scott and Johanna and et cetera uh, was so impressive to me um, that you know, it, it stood out as as um, almost heroic, and and you might say that's that's you know what Iggy is in a sense for us, uh, uh, somewhat of a heroic figure playing our music. Uh, but why don't we then? Is it going to be the first movement? Is that it okay. is the first, is movement, the first yeah. movement? Let's take a listen. Uh, and this story is such a great story: the the Jack London story, and then the Merwin. Uh, epic about it, but the Jack London story, it, it just takes your breath away. It's an, and apparently based on a true person, Ko Koal, Koalau. So anyway, let's listen to this that, that uh, may someday become operatic uh, material.
Thank you, John. Uh, Iggy, did you have any other comments about your work on that? If you recall it, it was quite a while ago. Well, John mentioned the slow movement, and, and sometimes yeah. slow things are very hard to, to perform, um, especially as a group. Uh, just the sense of timing kind of gets lost, and um, I, th I remember we had to work uh, uh, quite a bit on that. Okay. Now the next one is a piece of mine that is actually a video as well. So it's a, there's a visual uh, created by Peter Swansea. Peter is an excellent videographer, video artist, and uh, we um, fashioned a, a performance at the uh, Maui Arts and Cultural Center where they have the facility and the infrastructure for more elaborate multimedia so we figured we'd take advantage of that on a screen the work is called, uh, based on the poem by robinson jeffords called contrast um, and it involved the soprano rachel schutz uh, as well as johanna stephen flander and um let's see the uh, second violinist was probably uh um uh Helen. Helen yeah probably and it's listed on the on the video but uh, um it's was it is my the third setting of a poem by uh Robinson Jeffers and before we play it uh again it's a string quartet and you'll see it uh on um, downstage right of the and then the video the video also has a uh, in, embedded in it a painting that was commissioned for this work by the painter from Hilo, Thomas Belsky. So his impression of the poem, and you'll see that quite prominent in the video. And um, it's one of those productions that involved artists and musicians from three islands, tri-island synergy, we, we called it, but uh, it, it was gratifying to, to be able to do that. Let me just, it's a, not a long poem, so contrast, uh, the world has many seas, Mediterranean, Atlantic, but here is the shore of the one ocean. And here the heavy future hangs like a cloud, the enormous scene, the enormous games preparing way on the on the water and strain the rock. The stage is here. The play is conceived. 
the players are not found. I saw on the Sierra up the Kawea Valley above the Moro Rock, the mountain redwoods, like red towers on the slopes of snow. About their bases grew a bushery of Christmas green, firs and pines to be monuments for pilgrimage. In Europe, I remembered the Swiss forests, the dark robes of Pilatus, no trunk like these there, but these are underwood. They are only a shrubbery about the boles of the trees. Our people are clever and masterful. They have powers in the mass. They accomplish marvels. It is possible time will make them before it annuls them. But at present, there is not one memorable person. There is not one mind to stand with the trees, one life with the mountains. Okay, let's, it's about an eight minute piece.
let's move on. Iggy, do you remember, you've, you've uh, uh, performed the work uh, maybe four times, two different ensembles, but um, uh, any, any yeah, comment? Very vividly, I remember how professional and, and on point uh, Rachel was uh, in preparing your piece. I, I believe we also did the uh, Schoenberg String Quartet. Number That's two. right, second string um, quartet, yes. And this goes back to a comment I made earlier about uh, how I evolved. Um, I, I know earlier when I would do new music, I, I would see a complex rhythm and I would sort of be in the ballpark and I wouldn't like always count precisely. But I think as <laughs> I've evolved a little bit, now I try to pay more attention to what's uh, on the music and, and try to be more strict with the complex rhythms. So I, I know there were a lot of complex rhythms there from everyone and not always at the same time, but uh, um, all the better for my uh, engagement. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the piece is actually dedicated to Rachel. Where is she now, by the way? Do we know? Does anyone know? She's in Cornell, New York. Okay. She's teaching at Ithaca College, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right, Peter Swansea. What do you have for us? Um, so the work that, that I brought to share, I, I think it's the only time that I've, I mean, I've worked a lot with you, Iggy, in terms of sitting around backstage and talking story and being a part of the concerts from the technical point of view. Um, but I think that we've only had a chance to, to collaborate once before, and it was back in my 20s. I want to say it was like 12 or 13 years ago. And we were uh, we had a concert at Seabury here on Maui, and uh, I don't think it was the first time we'd met. We might have kind of done something together earlier, but it's the first time I'd written a, a piece of music with you in mind to play. And um, it, I wanted to try to find some way to to push you. And um, so what I did is I wrote a, a a piece for piano and violin with electronics. And your part, Iggy, was. Uh, emphasized a lot on uh, natural and artificial harmonics and different ways that you could um, use the fretboard and your techniques. And um, I didn't know at all what it would really sound like or how to get the sounds that I wanted. So what I, I did is I sort of created a, a framework and then I let you fill in the gaps and you find the way to create the sounds that would fit with both the electronics and with what Robert was playing. So Robert on piano, I had you place e bows, um, you know, those magnetic resonance devices inside the piano. And then I think you're also just throwing bits of uh, tuning felts into the piano too, to make a bunch of percussive sounds. And then Iggy, you were sort of reacting to that in terms of what you're playing. I, I don't think that the timing was very specific. It was just sort of everything was meant to be, you know, here's a 30 second chunk of music and here's a two minute chunk of music here. And then we'll just see how it kind of comes together. I think we only rehearsed it maybe not even half a dozen times and uh, you already totally overwhelmed me with questions. I was like, I didn't even have the answer to mm -hmm. have. It's like, you're saying, well, what do, you, what do you want here? Is it this or this? And I'm like, I, I have no answer. Let's just, let me hear both and then we'll choose one together, you know? So I felt like it was a fun collaborative work to kind of create that piece. It probably would stand to, to be revised at this point too, because I feel like, you know, as a composer, that was early, early in my time in Hawaii and uh, early in my time with Ebb and Flow Arts. Um, so it's hopefully something that I can track down again, revise, and then see if we can uh, do more with or expand upon someday. Um, but it was a real honor to be uh, commissioned by Ebb and Flow Arts for that work. I think that was my first Ebb and Flow Arts commission. So it was kind of the start of a, uh, a really exciting journey for me musically, you know, as a composer, but also, you know, in my 20s, kind of fresh out of college and, uh, you know, feeling like I was a, a real professional, you know, trying to earn my keep in the world and make a statement. And what is the title? Uh, the title is Leu Palu Palu Okai, which means the soft voice of water. And so there was a, a video accompaniment that went with that. And uh, I'm going to track that down. And it was sort of a very abstract, you know, waves. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much all of my video accompaniments are either waves or clouds these days. So. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Not sure. Must be living in Hawaii that inspires me to uh, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> create video like that, but um, leu palu palu okai. And uh, I mean, I'm obviously don't speak any Hawaiian at all, but uh, that was what I was trying to do was trying to create a piece that, that reflected uh, the beauty of the scenery and landscape here and also uh, capture some of the visual and, uh, you know, auditory aesthetics of the environment as well. Well, let's listen.
That's great. Thank you so much, Peter. And, <laughs> um, uh, Iggy, do you have any reflections? Not to mix metaphors, but... I, I do. I, I, I actually still have the uh, you, a letter uh, from Peter that he wrote. That, oh, look, uh, my signature. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't yeah, changed uh, somehow. Uh, revised November 26, 2007. So, <laughs> wow. um, very sim simple writing, um, harmonics, as, as, as Peter said, but uh, those can be treacherous to, to perform, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, you know, mix of tremolos, harmonics, um, the effects uh, are very clear, but the uh, execution um, is, yes. uh, requires practice. You, Iggy, uh, after we performed it at Atherton, and, and again, Peter said it's, it's a pretty much proportional notation. There's no uh, rigor around simultaneities in something, but you said, uh, my recollection, something like, that's the closest we've been together for any piece we've played. But um, it's, um, it, it definitely was a challenge and, and very innovative with those Ebo devices. So let's move on now to Don, Don Womack. What have you selected for us uh, on this podcast well, and videocast? I, I just want to say thank you to you, Robert, for inviting us to be here today. And, and thank you oh, sure. uh, for all the work that you do on behalf of New Music in Hawaii. Um, it's thank great for us to have the opportunity to talk about the work that we've done with Iggy over the years. Yes. And in my case, I've had the good fortune of knowing Iggy for, what, 23 years? I think he came about three years after I did to Hawaii. Right. And I've, I've been fortunate to work with him many, many times on pieces. Probably the biggest collaboration we did was the violin concerto that I wrote for him, which was premiered by the then Honolulu Symphony. Um, and uh, that, that was a massive piece, one of the biggest pieces I've written. It's about 37 minutes long. Um, and I wrote this piece, of course, with Iggy in mind. Um, and I was very excited at the time because I knew that I had this great virtuosic player to write for, and I did not hold back. Um, I threw pretty much everything at him, and he took it and more. And he really just gave some brilliant performances of this piece. Um, in fact, I, I remember one of my colleagues at UH saying that uh, she had never heard him sound better, and I totally agree. He just sounded fantastic. Um, so uh, Iggy mentioned earlier about he'd like to go back and revisit some pieces. Yeah, let's talk. I would love to <laughs> <laughs> revisit this piece. I'd like to go back and revise it. I think I could tighten it up a little bit, get it down to under half an hour. But I'd very much love to hear you play this piece again. Um, it was just such an incredible, incredible virtuosic and heartfelt performance of that piece. Um, the piece I've chosen today is, is a different one, though. Um, this is a piece for violin and koto. Um, and I was in 2007, 2008, I was living in Tokyo for the year on a Fulbright Fellowship, and I was working with a, a group uh, in Japan of uh, terrific musicians who play traditional Japanese instruments. And I was working with a koto player named Kimura Reiko, Reiko Kimura, um, who was, was very well known, just terrific, terrific virtuosic koto player. And I had this, this piece um, with violin. Iggy um, actually made a visit to Tokyo and performed this piece along with a couple of other pieces on a concert that, that we did there. Um, and this is a very, again, virtuosic piece. For some reason, um, I don't like to write easy music, apparently. Um, and Iggy just, just there's a lot of fireworks in this, um, and Iggy just burns right through them. Um, this piece has uh, a very driving character, like a lot of my music does. It's very complex rhythmically. It's, um, it has a strong rock and roll element, honestly. Um, in fact, the, uh, one violinist, not, not Iggy, but a different violinist who played this piece said that, uh, I, I like the way she put it, she said, I feel like I'm playing electric guitar in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Iggy played a very good electric guitar in Japanese on the recording of this piece, which we did for a CD um, about 10 years ago. This piece is called Strung Out.
yeah, again, Iggy, terrific, terrific performance on that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm reminded, um, getting back to the violin concerto, one of the fun things about that was that for the encore, uh, after he premiered the violin concerto, Iggy suggested that I come out on stage and join him for the encore, which was kind of terrifying for me. I, I was, uh, in a former life, I was a bass player, you know, I've been on parole now for many, many years. Uh, but even at that time, um, I hadn't really played bass for about 10 years, so when he suggested uh, that I come out and join him on a little jazz piece. Um, I was hesitant, but I did. Uh, kind of uh -huh. terrified playing with a great player who was so far above my level as a performer. Um, but somehow I managed to fake my way through it, or he was good enough <laughs> to pull me through I think it was what it was. But uh, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Iggy, do you have uh, some reflections on, on this work? Yeah, of course. Um, I was lucky that uh, Don uh, um, brought me to, to Japan to play this piece and to record it with uh, Riko Kimono-san. Um, I remember, you know, she's one of her premier koto player, and she was uh, waiting for us at the subway station when we went to see her for the rehearsal with Don. And, you know, this diminutive lady and took us to her apartment and and, and just then she started playing and just uh, kind of, wow. Uh, again, like Rachel and other musicians that I've been lucky to work with, she's been very professional and sometimes you, you, you don't know such a different style of, of music and, and you don't know if, you know, the pacing. Uh, you may have jazz musicians, you may have classical musicians together, and the sense of rhythm and pace is very different. Uh, but, but even like classical musicians, you may have string players, pianists, uh, wind players, and we have a different sense of pulse. Uh, that's every time, every time with everyone. I, and I don't think there's one sense of pulse, it's just people have different senses of pulse. And, but she was just, uh, she could adapt so well to everything, and it was. Uh, and Don's music has some complex uh, meters, uh, but it was just like very tight, very precise, um, and it's what I remember from the, the the privilege I had to work with such great people like herself. So the uh, modern music has enabled you to travel Japan, absolutely. South and Korea. Robert you went with Ebb and Flow. That was thanks to you, Robert. Yeah, uh, the uh, performance in Seoul. I, right. And it, it's funny because uh, so you you secured a performance at Ihua. Yes. I had never been. I had been had been to Korea and to perform um, on in other concerts, but Ihua is the the college, which was the premier uh, woman only college, that my mother went to. So. Uh -huh. The time that you brought us there was a time for me to discover where my mother had gone to college. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's kind of uh, yeah. And special. Don, were you in Japan for a Fulbright, or it was a considerable time you were there? It's a yeah, yeah, it was a Fulbright. Yeah, mm -hmm. very fortunate for, to have that. For a year, year, was it, or two? For years? a year, yes. For a year, great. And uh, maybe I haven't said it. Sorry, Robert, but uh, I know we're coming to a close soon. I uh, just want to appreciate everyone's yeah. work here on the panel. Um, you know, Peter, yourself, Robert, Michael, John, Takuma, Don, and and Tom. It's uh, a bunch of professionals with um, impeccable uh, artist senses, and and they're um, very lucky to work with great artists around the world. I know there's a bit of too much Iggy tonight, but uh, you know, <laughs> work with so many great artists, and yeah. I'm learning from them just as much as as maybe they've learned from me earlier, a few years back. Okay, well, um, as we do come to a wrap wrap up, um, my experience back east, as some of you know, was to. Uh, co-found uh, New York Guild of Composers and then to uh, found the Composers Guild of New Jersey. So uh, we've had some thoughts uh, some years ago. Uh, it was in fact Robert Wehrman who said that there should be some sort of composers cooperative here in Hawaii. And at the time, 
my feeling was that they're so uh, to set up another nonprofit beside ebb and flow would just um, leave us with so few resources in, in competition for such so few resources that maybe it wasn't a good idea but certainly my commitment and our commitment to the work of hawaii-based composers has kept going um most recently there was a, a work of thomas osborne that we performed our last performance in february at the library uh, at the uh, church the Lutheran uh, Church of Honolulu. And um, so uh, all of which is to say, again, in combination, there's strength. In, in combination, there's advocacy. So that this could be maybe the start of a regularly convening group as we're trying to get through this pandemic to consider ways in which we can be a strong advocate. Uh, for example, with the symphony, um, as Don alludes, it'd be nice to have a performance again of the violin concerto. In my own case, it was a rather difficult, uh, to say the least, uh, experience with the Maui Symphony when it was really a branch of the Honolulu Symphony. And uh, there was a performance they gave of a uh, piece of mine, and then the, uh, there was a sense of, of, of enough enthusiasm to ask me to write a second uh, piece or a, a sequel or, or whatever. And midway through the season, uh, the whole thing collapsed. And uh, a work of yours too, Don, may have been canceled that time. But um, my point is that there was never really an attempt to recoup that. That is, uh, in my experience as a, as a presenter, um, my feeling is that, that if it, we make a commitment to do a piece, we have to do it. If it, uh, and There were cases, for example, back east where a, a, an oboe and piano piece by the late Stephen Pallas, for example, uh, we gave it three or four performances because it did not satisfy the composer until that third or fourth composer. There was a piece by a colleague of mine, also the late Harold Oliver, an etude for a piano that was supposed to be done, but then came along the national student strike in uh, 72 or whenever it was. And so everything was canceled. And then came the Composers Guild. And it wasn't actually till 12 years later that I ended up performing that piece. It took a while and we joked about it. But the point is that there needs to be that push by us in, in my, my feeling to become more local, you know, in, in, in its view. The, uh, and um, if anyone could advocate for us, it would be Iggy because of his commitment to all of us. So that's one reason we might gather, you know, again, in combination rather than in competition at this point and suggest that uh, it could be, for example, a regular meeting, a regularly convening program committee of uh, ebb and flow arts if you're all interested well let's follow up uh, does anyone have any any you know thing to say about that and whether it's a good idea whether it's pointless during these times but we have to we have to assume that we're going to return to public performances it seems to me that's the operating assumption if we don't assume that well, either we're entering a whole new paradigm where uh, performers and, and, and uh, composers and uh, listeners are, again, melded together like they were in the 1600s or, uh, you know, some whole new uh, Zoom, uh, Internet uh, uh, fantasies of, about how we, we can handle our concerts or, um, and, and my fear is that the United States of amnesia, as Gore Vidal said in his book, uh, is operative here. That the longer we're without these public concerts as non-essential, the least essential in our culture, apparently, and the most dangerous, as long as we're with, the longer we're without them, the more our audiences will be satisfied with the Zooms and the 
you know, they'll just say, and, and this has been my experience already. People tell me, well, you know, we, we can see uh, performances now on Zoom and all, all, all that. It's, it's, you know, we're too easily um, um, satisfied, perhaps, uh, with the substitutes for, you know, down the line, the decaffeinated coffee, the non-alcoholic beer, the canned laughter, etc. cetera. Um, and so, again, my operating assumption is that we will resume public performances um, at some point. And I, I agree, Robert. And, and just this past week, I had two experiences. A, a couple of nights ago, uh, one of our doctoral students who um, is actually in, in Seoul right now, yeah. he's a composer in residence with an orchestra, and they did a portrait concert, which means they did an, a concert entirely of her works. Five premieres of five new orchestra pieces. This was a huge, huge night for her. And it was live streamed around the world. No audience. It was yeah. just the, the audience, the, the pieces came across very well. The performances were all very good. And it was a very, very strange experience to watch it on the screen so remotely and silence after the performance. There's no audience. Nobody's applauding. Yeah. Yeah. So it loses something there for sure. The audience is really a part of it. And then just last night, um, I caught some of uh, the concert that Iggy did with uh, some of his colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, in Orvis, and it was a great concert, beautiful playing Iggy. Um, but again, uh, very odd. I think there were a few people there, but, but you can sense when there's not that audience energy. I think that the players yeah. get feedback from the audience. You know, they, they draw energy from the audience. That's an important part of it. And from the audience perspective, I think it's a very different experience hearing a recording or hearing it on your screen as opposed to actually being there being up close, seeing the performers sweating, seeing how hard they're working, the physicality of it, hearing the physical or feeling the physical vibrations of the sound, you know, those are experiences that, that are, that touches really deeply that you simply cannot get anywhere other than a live performance. And I yeah. think it's even more incumbent on us than, than ever before to help educate audiences and, and as you mm -hmm. say, remind them of the value of live performance. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you completely, Don. I think that uh, the acoustic energy, the raw acoustic energy of being in the presence of performers, I feel like that energy does go two ways. I think it feeds the performance. And I think the performers feed the audience. And I think it satisfies our soul in such a deep and profound way to be in the presence of each other during that experience. And I feel like the audience and the performers collaborate in that sense in a way that could never be achieved online. It's great to have a conversation in this capacity. And I'm thankful that we can do it. But as soon as the concerts are back on, I mean, I think people are going to realize what they've been missing and flock to the concert halls and flock to the venues uh, just to just to express their gratitude for being able to be a part of that again. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, um, one of the we look for silver linings, too. And in this situation, I think we've seen like more possibility to to do things with people who are on the other side of the world. Mm. Uh, far away, it it wouldn't happen otherwise. And, you know, thinking locally and acting locally is super important. And and I, you know, I have to believe that our audiences are going to flock back once we can safely do that because people just need it. Like like you were all saying, uh, yeah. the the um, there is an incredible feeling though. I mean, we we just. Uh, these last couple of weeks, we had a. Um, I, I was collaborating with Haven Trio, which is a trio based sort of disparately between Toronto, uh, North Carolina, and Texas, and um, and this project involves someone who was in Indonesia and also in New York, and so finding that time difference that actually worked for everybody turned out to be like three o'clock Hawaii time in the afternoon, <laughs> you know, so it was eight o'clock in Indonesia and yeah. nine at 9 PM in New York city, but we made it work. And, you know, yeah. I, we wouldn't have done that uh, before this. So mm -hmm. yeah, kind of new times. 
certainly from an educational standpoint, one of the things that um, myself and my colleagues and, and other colleagues from around the world, I, it's like we all suddenly a light bulb went off at our head because we like to have guests, um, you know, performers and composers come and present for our classes and so forth. And it's like this light bulb went on suddenly that, hey, they don't actually have to come here. <laughs> this is yeah. a lot easier, right? So in that sense, yes, we definitely have some silver linings. But one of the problems is that performances, the technology is not there yet for people to be playing together, you know, on the other side of the world. The, the timing is so critical for music, and it's, we're not even close to anywhere technologically being able to Apparently do Apparently, the, these telematic performances have uh, gotten quite refined. Uh, where uh, Mark Dresser is doing this with um, someone, you know, a musician from Switzerland and Korea and himself in San Diego, and they've got it now where they can, uh, you know, blend the visuals so they look like they're on the same stage and they know each other's work, so they kind of synchronize well. Um, the best kind of pieces for that probably are things like Morton Feldman and Earl Brown, you know, Feldman famously said, don't listen to each other, <laughs> to ensembles. So th this would be ideal. But um, again, as we're saying, th there's, th it's a failure of the culture, in my opinion, that, we, that, it's, that people so easily settle for these substitutes for the real thing. And... Um, there's nothing we can particularly do about it except persist in our own way. And do all of you feel like that that makes sense to combine efforts in a certain way to strengthen our advocacy and, and so on? Or is it, uh, uh, we're here on Maui, you're in Oahu, but um, uh, is there any sense about that? Or um, I, Robert, I, agree. I think, think it's always good to combine resources collaboration is we're always going to be stronger as a whole rather than individuals yeah. community is super important mm -hmm. yeah robert what you mentioned about um the fear of art forms disappearing yeah I mean, it reminds me a little bit of what happened with the hawaii symphony when there was the home symphony and then went into bankruptcy and the biggest fear i had was that people would get used to it Yes. And they would um, listen to maybe concerts by high school orchestras, and I have right. complete admiration towards high school orchestras. But uh, sometimes the, the parents would say, oh, they sounded so great. And yeah. really, I respect that, and it is kudos. But I think <laughs> even uh, maybe high school orchestras do need role models, uh, something to look up to. And, and, and I just felt like maybe the every, everything would get lulled into some sort of, you know, flat line. Uh, and I think it's important to to advance the role of the Y Symphony, to advance live music, to advance new music, so that it's a good nourishment for the brain and for the soul. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, how is everyone doing with the pandemic? Uh, not to extend this too much longer, but um, what what do you find yourselves having particularly productive times uh, creatively? Uh, is it is it a is it a? Almost I, I want to ask Takuma. I, I want to yeah. ask Takuma because I, I go to mm. UH quite a bit every day to teach, and every time I walk by his studio, I see lights. Uh, the, the, his studio <laughs> has lights on, so I'm guessing that he's been writing nonstop. No, I've I've been focusing a lot more on the teaching part. So. Um, uh, transition to online teachings yeah um, there's definitely some learning curve so uh how to kind of redevelop the the same classes that i've been teaching so um i've definitely been putting more effort into trying to make sure the, the students at, at uh are uh getting what they need out of my classes and and it's been it's been a good chance to kind of re, re look at my what i've been teaching before and approach mm -hmm. it from a completely new way uh, instead of trying to just uh, regurgitate everything mm. from every semester or every year. So, uh, yeah, so it's a silver lining in that regard. Just uh, mm -hmm. just a nice chance to self-reflect on my own teaching. Uh, as far as compositions, 
Um, I've had, yeah, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure all of you had many cancellations. So the one I was most looking forward to, to writing was the Hawaii Symphony Commission um, that was supposed to take place in December, uh, but now it's been postponed indefinitely, hopefully for next season. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so it's a little hard to to get myself to write when um, you don't exactly know what the situation is. So initially I was thinking maybe I'll compose something that can be pandemic proof or it, we could have people spaced <laughs> around uh, the stage a little bit farther. So it, it's socially distanced in a strategic way from from the ground up. So how can I take, take advantage of that kind of more spatialized aspect? Uh, so I thought about uh, exploring that but then um, performances weren't going to take place even in, in that capacity. So, mm -hmm. um, and maybe if it's going to be a, a Zoom only performance, uh, which I hope, really hope I, it's not, but then if that were to be the case, then how can I, as a composer writing new music, maybe try to take advantage of these new mediums and not just try to look at it from uh, what it, I wish it could be from the past, but what, what are the new possibilities um, that are being presented uh, in this new situation? So uh, it's not ideal. And I, of course, would would like to write for an audience and hopefully that'll be the case come next next season. But yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I think, trying to look at new possibilities is always, always uh, what we're here for as composers. It's like, what can we actually provide uh, since we're creating something new that older works uh, won't, weren't really equipped to deal with our current situation. So, mm. Taku makes a good point there. And I think it's important for us all to remember that, you know, historically um, innovations come out of times of, of distress, out of crises, right? Um, innovations in business, innovations in technology, innovations in whatever, and including the arts, of course, and in music. If you look at, you know, fin de siècle Europe with the excesses that, that brought about these massive symphonic works, the, you know, Mahler symphonies, the Stravinsky ballets and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. that all came to a crashing halt with World War I, right? And out of the ashes of that came these other innovations, the neoclassical style and so forth. So artists are always going to find a way to deal with, you know, whatever the changing landscape is. And I have complete confidence that composers uh, and performers will find ways to deal with the new landscape that's going to emerge from this. Mm. Yeah, some have even said that the, the, the Renaissance came out of a plague, you know, um, that uh, regrouping and, and uh, reimagining and um, imagining, uh, you know, great new things and, and so forth. Um, even as you mentioned, World War One was there was the Spanish, so-called Spanish flu that probably somehow again uh, helped release an enormous amount of creative energy after we got through it. So it may be hopefully again a situation where we, we come out of it uh, uh, stronger, and that that would be my. Uh, hope certainly that uh, we do. Um, Michael, what are you working on these days? Uh, not that much. I'm I'm focusing uh, on teaching too. It's it's uh, uh -huh. you know you know as Takuma says you know transitioning into an online. It feels like it takes more work. Um, uh huh. Uh, I also feel like the if I, if 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 I were in person uh, the like a start time okay and then there's an end time to that class that's the time that i devote to that class material when it's online i feel like it's a 24 7 kind of feel uh, where i'm at I'm, I, I'm a resource for the students because there's no set time anymore um and so it's very exhausting um as for creative work i feel like i'm more of a, a ranger these past several months um many groups have asked me to arrange things for these kind of zoom like concerts or um mm -hmm. or rearrange larger works for smaller groups um so that's most of what i've been doing mm -hmm. i 
I've had the cancellations as well. Uh, I have one piece that I should be writing, but I'm so exhausted from <laughs> yeah. everything else. I just have no will to actually start mm -hmm. it, but it's due in a few weeks. Um, and that's for um, a violinist over uh, at the Boston Symphony. Um, so just a, a violin uh, duet with harp. Um, I know that I would want it to have some kind of Hawaii theme to it. Um, but again, finding that uh, motivation to uh, actually start and finish it is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, there's going to be a online performance and there's, there's the promise of having great plans for it in person when, uh, you know, concerts can resume again. Uh, but again, it's still very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your honesty, oh, Michael. It's a, it's a hard thing to talk about actually, because at the same time with the, you know, the, the cancellation of, of live performances for so many months now is not only disheartening, but the way that we feel about time now, I, I thought back in March, okay, maybe this is, it's kind of a relief. It's kind of a, a break, you know, during this terrible time, I can focus on myself and focus on reflection and developing new projects and, uh, you know, learning and reading and doing all that. And it's been really hard to find the time to do that because I feel like I'm constantly adapting to new things and waiting for something else to happen. And it's been a bit demoralizing and debilitating in that same way, but it's hard to find all the right words for it because those aren't really them. It's just, we're sort of in this void of waiting mm -hmm. to see what's going to happen and how do we get through this? And um, I really appreciated you saying that because it really, it really captured a bit of my sentiment too. Yeah, you know, at, at the start of it, I mean, I, I, I do enjoy the flexibility that teaching online gives. Um, mm. But it's been a while. It has been a while. <laughs> You've yeah. been doing online teaching for several months now. Uh, since, the, uh, yeah, since March. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was hard in March. Yeah. I mean, it was it was crazy because we didn't really know how to do it then. And we were just trying to figure it all out and figure out what works and what sticks. And there was technological issues and internet connection issues. And even if we've resolved some of those things, it doesn't make the experience any more, you know, natural. Yeah. Right. And you know, the, the, the comments I get from students is they, they do want the in-person learning. I mean, there's what, what I find was really difficult was things that I could address in a few seconds now, takes hours of preparation to do. <laughs> wow. yeah, exactly, because you, you can't, if you're in a classroom, you've got a chalkboard, you've got the, you yeah. know, the CD player, you've got all these resources, and you can let the conversation go wherever and respond to it and immediately go write this chord on the board or whatever. You can't do that online because you have mm. to have all your slides and everything prepared in advance. So it takes a light, away a lot mm. of the spontaneity of it, in mm. addition to just being much more tedious and time consuming to mm. prepare. Do you generally find the students are satisfied uh, with this? The, the, you, you mentioned they prefer uh, in person, but given all the work you're clearly doing to adjust, are the students satisfied? I think they're making the best of the situation. And I, tr I try to make my um, the videos that I put together for the students, I tried to make them as interactive as possible, as interesting as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking of the assignments, how can I make it more interesting, but also how can I make it more doable for them since now they're not able to uh, use the resources that are available to them at school. Um, so it's, 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 I think it's the best of, so there's a silver lining in that uh, a lot of them now are a little bit more tech savvy. So. I'm, I know the technology a bit more now, uh, but I, yeah, I, I mean, as a, from the instructor's perspective as well, I do miss the spontaneity. I, I agree. I think the students are making the best of it. They're doing the best mm -hmm. they can, just like we're doing the best we can, but ultimately, not all subjects, not all classes, but I think most of them, certainly ones I teach, are going to be better off in person. And mm -hmm. I look forward to getting back to in person, and I think the students mostly do as well. At least it what? works for us. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, John. Um, no, no, no. Yeah, it works for us to teach online for theory and composition, for ensembles and performances. It's just uh, not possible. So, at least, yeah, for 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 what we do, it's possible. And 
uh, for our students on Oahu, they don't have to commute, which can take many hours during during uh, normal times. So they're getting a few extra hours of sleep or not having to wake up to it as early as before, which is nice. <laughs> well, it's got to be. I was just going to say that. Go ahead. The- one of the one of the things that uh, that I think students are noticing is that they do have more access to to us, and mm-hmm. you know, in a way, that that's what's exhausting, but also good that that there is you know perhaps more individualized attention than what would normally happen in a classroom situation. Uh, you know, there there's the possibility for more one on one. Interaction. I think the one on one is really effective in this platform, or it can be really, really effective in this platform. I reached out to a lot of students. Uh, so I work with I work with younger kids, and I work in the capacity of an after school program uh, run at a local youth center. And I found that working with the the limited kids that I was able to work with uh, throughout the late spring and early summer. Um, I really enjoyed just at times just having a conversation, being able to check in and see how they're doing. Um, and then, you know, maybe their their mother or father would walk by and I'd get them on the video and we'd just talk for a little bit, just, you know, two humans connecting and uh, yeah. realize that we miss that a lot. And uh, it's doing everything online, it's kind of like looking out the window and never quite going outside. And uh, it, it wears on a person. And I feel like, you know, too much of that and we're never leaving the house. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to respond as a student now doing that. I I think that I would do my best, but it would be hard to be as effectively engaged. So I completely understand that students would want to get back to in-person classes. And I hope that's possible soon. I I have no idea how long or when or where. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, again, thank you all. Now, uh, Iggy had mentioned not being Iggy centric and then my, comment was eccentric and you know we have chickens on the property so um um actually the spirit of the chicken is is kind of gotten to me and um Audio version is going to be very strange. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Okay. All right, guys. Well, uh, let's stay in touch. And um, if any of you are willing to uh, to meet, to, you know, regularly in a, in a program committee to plan, you know, uh, one story. Um, is very memorable from the Dutch composers way back in the 60s and 70s. They formed a group, wrote an opera, Reconstruction, Peter Schad, Louis Anderson, Reinbert de, Lo, de Leo, um, Mengelberg, etc. And eventually decided they're going to pressure the Concertgebouw into playing their music, which the Concertgebouw had not been doing. So they organized a clicking, you know, these little clicker things and went to a concert and before the de- first downbeat, they all started pressing their clicking machines, <laughs> kind of making noises, disrupted the whole concert, caused a riot. And Scott told us that he was almost impaled in the lobby. The police protected him, but it was a quite a raucous thing that did eventually lead to uh, more performances for the Dutch composers. Now, we don't have to start a riot necessarily, but um, it, it points to the efficacy of combination pressure from a lot of us to make things change a bit. Civil disobedience? Civil disobedience. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. 
Okay, does anyone ha have any uh, final thoughts? Otherwise, we'll call it a, 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 an afternoon. Appreciate it very much. Well, thank you, Robert. Stay well. Thank Stay you, well and, Robert. And, and be safe. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you, Robert. Okay. And, and thank you all for your feedback and candor and uh, sharing yeah. your music with us today. And thanks, Iggy, for also lending us all your celebrity over the years. <laughs> and, and we'll we'll post this pretty soon. <clears throat> and you'll get a, a, a notice. It's on... Uh, the podcast um, are on our uh, website, edmundflowarts.org. We'll post it elsewhere, but um, it should be up pretty soon. Isn't that right, Peter? You have some work to do on it, editing, but. Yeah, we'll get it up within about a week. And okay. um, if any of you actually want to email me uh, either a link to your own personal website or yes. a catalog of your music that we could um, include as a link on the page, That'd be great. I'm not sure how effective those are for uh, marketing and outreach for yourselves, but at least uh, it's available for any audience that wants to interact with uh, your music or your work more. So you can go ahead and email that to me um, and that can be added at any time. The podcast should be up in about a week, but if you email me later, I can always update it another time too. So Sounds good. Peter. All right. All right. Thanks. Well, have be well, everybody. Hey, I, just, love you. Uh, I just sent you a link in a chat. Peter. <laughs> um, I got it. Thanks so much. Sorry. I had to open up the window. You guys are welcome to do that too. <laughs> all right. So thank you all for coming today. And uh, like I said, really appreciate all of your time and, and effort and energy and dedication. Wishing you the best of luck moving forward you. too. You too. Hope everybody's doing well. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. All right. Thanks. Aloha everybody.